The America's Cup races are sailed between two boats known as 12-meter yachts, built to a complicated measurement formula designed to keep the boats closely competitive. A 12-meter crew consists of 11 world-class sailors, each with highly defined roles. By the time the 83 races rolled around, millions of dollars and thousands of hours had been spent by those whose passion was to win the America's Cup. The Cup was first won from the British in 1851 by the yacht America, for which it is now named. It was deeded to the New York Yacht Club, and 132 years later, on the 25th defense, the club's tight hold on the cup would be shaken by the race of the century. The 1983 cup races were as much a competition of technology as they were of sailing skills. It was the first time that challengers from other countries were permitted to use superior American technology. The New York Yacht Club knew their defense would have to be tougher than ever before. Irrepressible Tom Blackdollar was one of three possible cup defenders. When he wasn't racing boats, he was racing cars. They're both just competition. I don't like skiing or painting or hiking in the mountains. I just love competition. And if I can't do it, then there's no reason for me to, to live. Some call his style sailing a la seat of the pants. Others say he's blessed with a sixth sense. Oh, I think sailing is uh, very much 70% art and only 30% science. I think it's, it's much more an art than it is a science. And I think that every time the scientists get in it, the vagaries of the wind and the waves and the currents foul them all up. His arch opponent and personality opposite, Dennis Connor, equally determined to defend the cup. Connor successfully defended the cup in 1980 on a boat called Freedom. For the 1983 matches, he upped the ante, putting in more time, more money, and more 12-meter yachts than ever before. In an effort to produce a breakthrough boat, Connor developed three brand new 12-meters, hoping one would be the fastest 12 ever. We had some ideas that a uh, lighter displacement boat would work uh, after Sailing Freedom in 1980, and that wasn't successful. We felt like we, we wanted to go outside the, the standard 12-meter think process, and when we didn't uh, come up with something that was a breakthrough, we felt that we better go back and optimize uh, what we knew and uh, what we had in freedom and make a small bit of progress if we could. Liberty was the end result of this expensive experimentation. Liberty's fast. Yeah. I hope it's fast enough. Liberty was a slight improvement on freedom, but hardly Connor's hoped for a breakthrough. Oh, well, win. But it never hurts to be lucky. The third contender to defend the cup, John Coleus, the youngest, the least experienced, the underdog. Our crew is small, but real quick. We did that on purpose. Courageous is notoriously a good, heavier boat. 
I think we work closer as a team than anybody else. We don't have anybody taking the spotlight and stuff like that. We kind of all share the blame and the glory equally. In June 1983, these three men and their seven challengers from around the globe began their final countdown to the America's Cup races on the seas and shores of elegant Newport. From Victoria, Australia, Challenge 12. From Canada, Canada 1. From Sydney, Australia, Advance. From Great Britain, Victory 83. From France, France 3. From Perth, Australia, Australia 2. Seven challenging yachts, all determined to unbolt the cup from the New York Yacht Club. Chino Ricci, skipper of the Italian syndicate, spoke for his fellow challengers. I think the America's Cup is the goal of all the sailors of the world. When you begin to sail a little boat, you dream of the America's Cup. This is the reason all people here fight uh, for the America's Cup, for, the, for this event. This, is, this was the goal of, of all these people for two years and from the beginning of the series here in the United States. The summer transformed the normally conservative town into an international theater, and the Italians in particular brought their own special gusto to Newport. Then there was the young Canadian team. Inexperienced, underfunded, they were considered long shots. But their problems didn't discourage the determined Canadian skipper, Terry McLaughlin. I can see how we're underdogs. We, just, we haven't got the equipment really the other teams have or the practice. So we're just trying to make up with that, I guess, with heads up sailing. We know how smart we are, and we know how much we have to learn, and it's an incredible amount to be able to sail against and you know, beat the Americans um, is the first step. And at least we know what we have to do, what we think, and now it's just a question of going out and doing it. In sharp contrast, the British, led by a business tycoon who would spend whatever it took, Peter de Savary. If you're trying to win something which someone else has had for 131 years, I think one really has to be very serious, and we are here to win. So uh, I suppose inevitably it appears that we're here to win at any cost, um, and within reason that's true. I think it's very true you can uh, burn yourself out well in advance of the actual races. It's a long campaign, and it's very arduous, and uh, I think we're making this whole campaign fun. There is America's Cup fever, without doubt. I caught it, and I decided, as I like boats and everything to do with them, and I like competitive uh, challenges, that I would combine sailing with those desires, and hence, we're here to try to win the America's Cup. The Australian effort was dominated by the pugnacious Alan Bond, back for the fourth time to get the Cup with his modest and brilliant skipper, John Bertrand. In the past, the Australians had come closer than anyone to defeating the Americans. They arrived in the summer of 83 with unshakable confidence that this was their year. Alan Bond brought his mysterious and controversial New 12 Australia 2. From the very beginning, Australia, too, was surrounded with secrecy. Bond shrouded his supposed secret weapon, the boat's keel, in what were delicately called modesty skirts. When can we get a picture of your keel? This keel? Yeah. Oh. Two, three months, maybe, after we've won the cup. 
Well, I don't think there's any doubt in the world that Australia's going to take the cup back to uh, Perth um, because we have the secret weapon there that people think it's the but really it's the expertise of the Australians that are going to win it. <laughs> Crack of dawn. Youngest America's crew average age wise ever. I'm not sure why or how it is. Maybe it's something to do with the skipper being young and everybody else is just younger. More younger people are getting involved in the sport. I'm not sure. What's your salary? Three meals a day and a place to live, plus some green t shirts. Coleus with his older yacht Courageous and Tom Blackaller with his new yacht Defender were members of the same syndicate. They called themselves stablemates. They were rivals, but friendly rivals. Their common goals were to sharpen each other's skills so that one of them would beat out Dennis Connor. They would undergo three months of trial races against each other, June through early September. Their performance in these races would determine which of the three teams would be chosen as the American defender. The competition between the three crews was tight. Each boat had its strong points in various wind conditions, and each had its winning and losing streaks throughout the summer. But as the weeks went on, the young, courageous crew went from underdogs to rising stars, and they were without question the sentimental favorites to defend the cup. Arch rivals from way back Blackaller and Connor slugged it out all summer. Blackaller's outspoken distaste for Connor's personal style and approach to the sport resulted in verbal volleyball on land and fierce battles on the water. But Defender suffered from design limitations. After three major modifications and no dramatic sign of improvement, Blackaller's chances for selection darkened. While the American trial races are not scored, they are studiously observed and evaluated by the New York Yacht Club Selection Committee. The committee looks for excellence in strategy, tactics, boat handling, and boat speed in all weather conditions. How far? Work hard. Six four. By the end of August, it was clear that Blackaller's new yacht could not develop the necessary boat speed to defend the cup. On August 27th, Tom Blackaller and the Defender crew were excused from further racing. Did 
best. And at it, the seven challengers were carrying on their own series of trials in a complicated formula of round-robin races managed by an international committee. Unlike the American series, the challenger races were scored. Throughout the series, Australia, too, with her mysterious keel, proved almost unbeatable. The remaining six were closely competitive. But by August, the weeding process had begun. The syndicate head of the French team accepted his fate with customary good humor. So we shall be in Newport in 86. And our computer made our new keel. So as we have nothing to buy, I would like to show you our new keel. Maybe it's <laughs> Advance was dismissed and dismantled. And then her Australian sister challenged 12. I'm sorry we didn't win it, but uh, we put up a credible performance. Uh, the record stands that uh, we won. Chairman of the Challenge 12 syndicate, Richard Pratt, would now put his hopes on Australia too. On August 22nd, the Challengers Race Committee eliminated the Italian team. They had made it to the semifinals, but were finally outscored. For Chino Ricci, it was a sad day, but he had reason to be proud, too. His young crew and his new yacht at Sura had come far on their very first time out. Also a semifinalist, Terry McLaughlin's Canadian crew was almost a Cinderella story. Midnight came for them as well. And then what had been simmering all summer long blew up. Controversy over Australia 2's mysterious and to some illegal winged keel. It had begun with a warning to the New York Yacht Club from Dennis Connor's navigator, Halsey Harishaw. It has been evident once we've learned something about the uh, keel that they have their sort of a trick which uh, in effect makes the boat deep. And at the present moment, this uh, depth of the keel, which is a very important factor in the performance of the boat, is not being rated uh, as that. And it's our feeling that it should be, and that was the reason I uh, worked to bring the controversy to the fore. We have a 12 meter. Um, the uh, tactics are expressed in the statement here uh, are unacceptable. Um, quite clearly, the, the yacht is measured. We'll continue to race. In order for it to be a really proper race in the tradition of the America's Cup, a race not only of design but of the sailing, it's important that uh, there be fairness in the rating of the boats, and that's all that we ask for. Fortunately, we race under international rules, and not rules set up for the benefit of one club. And while yachting worldwide has an international body uh, that, do, that administers it, we're quite satisfied that uh, all uh, will be well and we'll be on the starting line. Bear in mind, we've still got the task in front of us to, uh, to become the challenger. And that's our moving point. But it was not all racing competition and bitter bickering over the rules. There were good old fashioned high society times. when you feign friendliness with your favorite foe, particularly if the media is watching. The stage was set for what would be the final show. All summer long, De Savary had pushed his team to the limit. A 
but his buttoned-up, expensive, and almost military approach to the event couldn't produce the necessary boat speed to beat Australia too. By the first mark in this crucial race, Australia 2 led victory 83 by a huge margin. Throughout the series, Australia 2 demonstrated remarkable speed and turning ability. Was it the secret keel? Many thought so. This race, like most for Australia 2, was a walk away. As she approached the finish line, Australia 2's lead was so great and victory so certain that the crew lowered the jib even before the race was over. So Peter de Savary would not retrieve the cup for Great Britain. The Australians happily accepted the role of challenger and awaited the day when they would meet America's defender. Warren Jones, executive director of the Australia 2 Syndicate. As from today, the New York Yacht Club will be sailing against the Royal Perth Yacht Club and Australia 2. And I predict, quite frankly, that we will win 4-3. I think the results will be three all at the last day, and that'll be the 24th of, of uh, September. And uh, we'll win 4-3 because uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And we'll take this cup to Australia and be quite happy to give it to any country that wins it from us on the racetrack. The New York Yacht Club Selection Committee, a group of straw-hatted gentlemen whose task it was to select the American defender. By September 2nd, the selection had not been made. It was down to two very tight contenders, Courageous and Liberty. We start off early in the season to see uh, who has boat speed, who has the best sails, who has the crew work. One thing that we do want to make sure of is that uh, we do get an all-around boat. Right now, we don't know for sure which boat will do the job, but uh, we've got two good ones left. The last race between Liberty and Courageous was as close as they had been all summer long. Coleus and the Courageous crew had won everyone's hearts. But most observers thought the more experienced Dennis Connor would be selected. With her controversial keel now ruled legal, Australia too presented a formidable challenge. The selection committee knew they would need a seasoned skipper who could handle the pressure and a boat that would be competitive in all wind conditions. Don't you like that Liberty is being a little bit better? I agree. I guess what we've been looking at is the, uh, the young new sailors against the guy who's really been around. And he's practiced against another 12 for, what, six years now? Almost exclusively again to any other sailor. On September 2nd, John Coleus and his crew were eliminated.
for the selection committee, the next stop would be easier. Has its, its ways, and you never know uh, what the uh, big chiefs will, will do. So it would be presumptuous of us to uh, assume anything until we actually see them on the scene. What, what do they say to you? I mean, do they do they congratulate you? Uh, what, what are they? Well, they don't have to say too much. We knew why they were there, and uh, we appreciated uh, their visit. And I think that meant as much as anything because. Uh, they know that we've worked hard and we appreciate their support. And uh, we hope, hopefully we can take it from here. This is Jack. The America's Cup Challenge Down Under continues after this word. September 14, 1983. Liberty and Australia 2 finally meet for the first time. As the boats headed out, like two racehorses heading for the starting gate, a nervous question rippled through the New York Yacht Club. Could Dennis Connor keep the Australians in check? At the start line, Australia 2 displays her superb maneuverability and beats Liberty over the line by three seconds. The first leg answers much of the speculation about the competitiveness of the two boats. As they tack back and forth, the lead changes twice. The boats are never more than a boat length apart. At the mark, Australia 2 leads, but by only eight seconds. On the third leg, with the wind coming from behind, Connor uses shrewd tactics. He blankets his opponent, steals Australia 2's win, and takes the lead again. On the fifth leg, Australia 2 threatens to catch up. Suddenly, something happens. Alan Bond. Uh, the uh, outcome was affected by the damage we had when we jibed just slightly behind Liberty and the steering collapsed. So Liberty had won the first race, but Connor knew he was in for a fight. Well, it's nice to uh, get the first win under our belt, but uh, one win doesn't make for a series, and uh, I'd like to get three more before we get too excited about it. Liberty took the second and a 2-0 lead in the best of seven series. Light winds canceled the third race when the maximum race time expired, but Australia 2 had shown her strength. Well, it's obvious that Australia 2 uh, has superior maneuverability before the start, so I would say that the Liberty crew are trying different techniques on how to start against us. It's anyone's guess. The boat, obviously, is a, is a very good yacht and uh, capable of winning the America's Cup. At one point, the Australian boat led by a frightening six minutes. At a press conference, Connor reacted. Does this scare you, how badly uh, Australia 2 was ahead uh, when the wind... Well, actually, um, I think we're making a lot of progress because in 1980, when the time limit expires, they were a mile ahead, and today they're only half a mile, so I think we're really making a lot of progress. In a rerun of the third race, Australia won by a record margin. In the first two races, Australia was outsailed and outlucked. In the third race, the margin of victory has to have thrown a serious scare into the defenders' camp. With a 2-1 score for Liberty, the fourth race is pivotal.
Dennis Connor seems to have caught John Bertrand by surprise at the start, outmaneuvering the agile Australian boat and crossing the line with a six-second lead. With Liberty leading handily, on the reaching leg, Australia 2 changes her spinnakers, trying to catch more wind. But it doesn't work. Liberty crosses the line 43 seconds ahead of her opponent. Again, Dennis Connor has withstood the challenge of the mysterious winged keel of Australia 2 and kept alive sport's longest winning streak. What? You're asking if she's fast. Yes, she's fast. No, I'm asking, firstly, are you still in the dark about what the winged keel does do for Australia too. Well, first of all, if you're a race to race horse in a race that had a blanket around his legs, I mean, it's hard not to be in the dark. So we'd like to see what we're racing. So number one question, yes, we are in the dark. And yes, we'd like to see what we're racing. Race number five. With a 3-1 score in his favor, Connor hopes he can end the series. But the unexpected happens, equipment failure. This time on Liberty. Basically what happened is the three quarter inch uh, stock that comes out collapsed and so we had no port jumper. This happened about 35 minutes before the uh, signals. So we uh, radioed the shore and in the meantime, we had two people aloft, which was uh, heroic to say the least. I don't know too many people you could have paid to be there in that kind of sea. And they got tremendously bruised. So the new part arrived and uh, we got it up to mass and they installed it two minutes before the signals. There were moments of high tension for the American crew just before the start of this fifth race, an apparent problem with rigging on the mast. Dennis Connors' crew scrambled up, made a repair. Somehow they were ready for the start and indeed beat the Australians to the line, a 37-second lead. But three minutes after the start, Liberty's jumper strut breaks again, and the Australian boat shoots ahead. Startling developments on the first leg as Australia 2 managed to overcome a 37-second deficit from the start. An in-attacking duel against Liberty up the first leg has recovered all of that and more. Indeed, Australia 2 leads by 24 seconds as they round the first mark. Never in modern America's Cup history has a foreign challenger won more than one race. It looks today like John Bertrand will give Australia 2 its second win in this series, and who knows what can happen after that. Despite a 37-second deficit at the start line, Bertrand has Australia 2 in front by 52 seconds, coming down the final leg. Um, I think the most important thing about the race was that the crew and John were able to come back. So the, um, there is only room for one error. With now just a 3-2 lead in the series, the Americans' luck seems to be running out. The Australians are catching up. And as their success grows, so does their popularity. I would like to present to you this magnificent display case made in Perth of jarrow wood, which is only found in Western Australia for you to place the America's Cup in if you are victorious, and to display it in your yacht club in Australia. Uh, it's uh, rather an interesting box. Um, in the sixth race, Australia beats Liberty by another record margin to even the series at three all. It has come down now to one final race. As I have sat here for the last two or three evenings, uh, when the score was not particularly uh, good for us and said that we would go on with the equipment and the people and the boat and so on that we have to, uh, to win the America's Cup, I believe that we will do that. How does it feel, though, being the first in 132 years, which is a very long time, to be in this situation of three all? I mean, it must concern you. Well, it's going to be very exciting to be involved in the race of a century. And uh, at this point, uh, we're hoping that uh, we can find a way to prevail like we have in over the last 132 years. Somehow, uh, I think we'll pull it out on Saturday. September 26, 1983, the last race, the final showdown. 
The unimaginable in American sailing history could become reality. The loss of the America's Cup for the first time in its 132-year history. The pressure must be unbearable on skipper Dennis Conner of Liberty. He has reduced the ballast on his boat in a final effort to fend off the threatening challenge of Australia too. Will the American strategy work? We'll find out. Before the start of the race, the two yachts cautiously stay clear of each other, trying to avoid a possible foul and disqualification in this climactic race. At the start, Connor takes the favored side and crosses ahead of Australia 2. The first leg, a neck-and-neck -neck battle for the lead. In a heated tacking duel, Australia 2, once again showing her remarkable maneuverability, catches up, but not for long. An incredible turn of events in this deciding race for the America's Cup. After Connor had led by eight seconds at the start, the Australian boat was in front with a big lead when the two boats crossed for the first time. But here at the mark, the American boat is back in the lead by 29 seconds. At the second mark, Liberty adds 26 seconds to her margin and leads by nearly a minute. Throughout the final series, Australia 2 has not done well on the reaching legs. However, coming down to this mark, she has now reduced the margin to just 23 seconds as they head into a windward leg, and that's Australia 2's strength. downwind fifth leg, the two boats are tacking in different directions. Connor may be getting into trouble. He's not covering his opponent, and that frees the Australian boat to find new wind. Three miles down the leg, Australia 2 is passing Liberty again. In an attempt to regain the lead, Connor initiates a furious tacking duel, but Bertrand covers Liberty again and again, 46 times. In a last-ditch effort to get clear wind, Connor sails toward the spectator fleet. But Bertrand is over the finish line. It's all over. The Australians have won the America's Cup. Australia 2, the mysterious wing keel boat from down under, has ended the longest winning streak in sports history. If somehow in the future years, this stems a tide and makes our country as proud of its flag, and you are of yours, then we've certainly stretched the bonds of friendship. And it really was a very emotional moment. So proud, a great Australian and a great Australian effort. You know, an event like this wouldn't be possible unless you had a great competitor. And to Dennis and his crew, I would like to say, if we had to win it, I'm sorry it had to be you. It's a fulfillment of a dream which has come true. And it's certainly the greatest day of my life, yes. This is the bolt that's kept the cup in place for 132 years. This is the greatest thing you could do for our country, Australia. Now it's my great privilege to present the trophy here. As I said before, I hope he doesn't keep it too long. But take good care of it. We're going to be back out in three or four years whenever they decide to go get it. And I have just had a call this morning from a group in the United States who says they're going to challenge already. This is Jack Whitaker. The America's Cup challenge down under. More to come right after these words.